This week on Vaticano, the Vatican issues a decree extending the time Catholics can obtain the All Souls Day plenary indulgence. Also, we meet the new special delegate to the Order of Malta, selected by Pope Francis from among the 13 new cardinals, and discover the history of the Pope's three other papal guards in an interview with theologian and Vatican expert Ulrich Nerzinger. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. The month of November starts with the Feast of All Saints and follows with the commemoration of all deceased souls. This is the time when Catholics reflect on the end of life and pray for their deceased family members. Pope Francis celebrated Mass on All Souls Day in the Church of the Teutonic Cemetery, Santa Maria in Campo Santo, in the Vatican. The message of his brief homily was on Christian hope. We must ask for it. Hope is a free gift that we never deserve. It is given. It is granted. It is grace. After the Mass, the Pope prayed at the tombs in the cemetery and then also in the Vatican grottos at the tombs of the deceased pontiffs. Later in the week, he celebrated Mass in St. Peter's Basilica for the six cardinals and 163 bishops who died this year. Ido Etienne's news outlet, Catholic News Agency, reports at least 13 bishops died after contracting COVID-19 between March 25th and October the 31st, including Archbishop Oscar Cruz in the Philippines, Bishop Vincent Malone in England, and Bishop Emilio Alloway, an auxiliary bishop of Boston. The church offers a plenary indulgence for those who attend Mass on All Souls Day, but due to the pandemic, with a Vatican decree issued on October the 23rd, it can be obtained throughout the entire month of November 2020. The decree was signed by Cardinal Mauro Piacenza, major penitentiary of the Vatican's Apostolic Penitentiary. I thought that for many it would be extremely difficult to not be able to go, not only to bring two flowers to their deceased, because this is an external expression, but it is something very kind and that brings attention to this dogma of faith on resurrection and eternal life. Thus, I thought that it would be great, since the plenary indulgence is tied to a specific day, namely the second, to visit cemeteries, etc. According to the new decree, now the faithful have the entire month of November to visit a cemetery and pray for the deceased in order to fulfill the requirements of the indulgence. Certainly, it is fundamental, that is, one cannot receive the indulgence if the conditions are not fulfilled, which are confession within eight days of the feast, or some days before or some days after it, confession, Eucharistic communion, and then, fundamentally, detaching one's heart from sin, from sinful affections, from all that. So this is needed also from venial sins and not only from mortal sins. Another unique aspect of the decree enables the faithful to spiritually visit a cemetery if they're unable to physically go.
This allows all of the sick, elderly, and homebound to participate in the indulgence from their homes while completing the conditions of the indulgence. Reciting prayers for the deceased, such as the Rosary or Chaplet of Divine Mercy before an image of Jesus or Mary. Pope Francis named Archbishop Silvano Maria Tomasi, one of the 13 new cardinals to be created on November the 28th, his special delegate to the Order of Malta. Archbishop Tomasi worked from 2003 to 2016 as permanent observer to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, leading the Holy See's diplomatic mission there. What do you think? In an interview with EWTN News Vatican correspondent Colm Flynn, the Archbishop confessed the appointment came unexpectedly. So my reaction was to thank the Pope for the gesture of confidence, but I thought honestly that it was a sign that the Pope gave to the religious family I belong to that for years, over a hundred years, has been working with migrants and refugees. And Pope Francis is very sensitive to this issue and he speaks often about it. And the second uh, thought that came to my mind was Pope Francis wants to highlight the importance for the new diplomacy of the Holy See, a multilateral uh, action and uh, the fact that uh, it is important for the Holy See to be present in the international arena in multilateral diplomacy and contribute its values of humanity, of respect of the person, of equality, of sensitivity to the differences of culture and race and so forth. Um, that help values that help to build a, a peaceful way of living together in the variety of lifestyles and uh, attitudes that we see today in society. What do you think, Your Excellency, when you look around the world today and you look at countries like France and the recent terrorist attacks and you look at changing attitudes in some countries towards migrants? This makes some people uncomfortable because the encounter with these new people disturbs uh, habits and way of doing things in the receiving countries. There is the additional problem of the perception of Islam as endorsing violence, and this is not correct, but uh, the events of some smaller groups of fanatics tend to confirm this view. And uh, we need to educate ourselves to understand that the people coming are mostly people like us, with the same aspirations of forming a family, raising children, uh, being comfortable with their neighbors, isn't that the challenge when people are watching their TVs at home and they see the news of uh, people being decapitated in churches to try and keep that sense of calm and cool and rationale when looking at the situation, it may be difficult for them. And that is why maybe they jump to the conclusions 
block out immigrants, block out all of Islam. Um, it, it's a tough, tough thing to tackle, isn't it? Yes, I think we should not ignore the feelings and of people. And because uh, if we ignore them, we do not arrive at a dialogue and eventually a solution of these problems. So we have to be realistic and take into account the fact that uh, the violence that is perpetrated creates a barrier to communication between groups. At the same time, I would say that uh, we have to be wise enough not to generalize. When you mention dialogue, I, <clears throat> I think and I wonder, in your 13 years working at the United Nations in Geneva, was that a challenge to be representing the church and her teachings when often it would conflict with the teachings and policies and advice of the United Nations? Was that a great challenge for you? Yes, <laughs> to be very short. <laughs> My task was to explain in a way that was reasonable the position of the Holy See. The Holy See defends values that in the long run are considered good for the whole human family independent of specific religious beliefs. We say defending life is good for the human family. If you are a Buddhist, a Muslim, a, a Christian, it's always good to defend life. Your Excellency, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you so much for your time and good luck in your new roles. Thank you very much. and. Uh, God willing, it will be another chapter in a long life. <laughs> and a good chapter at that. Stay tuned. After a short break, learn how the Pontifical Swiss Guard became the sole military force of the Vatican. The Pontifical Swiss Guard is the smallest army in the world. It's had the privilege of protecting the Roman Pontiff for centuries. But did you know that until 1970, the Pope had three other guard corps in his service? The director of EWTN Germany, Martin Rottweiler, finds out how their time at the Vatican came to an end in an interview with the theologian and Vatican expert, Ulrich Nersinger. The Pope had four papal guards, the first of which was the Papal Noble Guard, bodyguards which consisted of about 70 Roman aristocratic men. Then the famous Swiss Guard, with a strength of about 110 men. The third was the Palatine Guard, a citizen's militia of about 500 men. And the final guard was the papal gendarmerie, made up of 150 gendarmes. What were the tasks of this guard? Primarily, they had to protect the Pope and his territory. At large celebrations, they served as an escort to the Holy Father. The men also served as throne guards, as it was called at the time. Today, this service is known as the honor service. Then the guards were present at all the great ceremonies. For example, they were present at the audiences, even the audiences in the Apostolic Palace. But they were also stationed at the individual halls. They served as guards during these events. They were positioned in certain areas, 
and they provided the guests with an honorary service. It was a very, very colorful image that the Vatican presented. What happened on September the 14th, 1970? On that day, Pope Paul VI wrote a letter to his Cardinal Secretary of State, Jean Villot, asking him to inform the commanders of the four guards of an important decision. The decision was that the Noble Guard and the Palatine Guard would be disbanded and that the papal gendarmerie would be transformed into a civilian police force. Only the papal Swiss Guard would continue to exist as before in all its functions and its presentation. How did the Holy Father justify this step? He justified this step with the decisions and intentions of the Second Vatican Council. The Council had demanded that the environment of the Pope, the Papal Court at the time, should be more strongly adapted to the religious dimensions of St. Peter's office. It seemed natural to the Pope at the time in the late 60s to remove the military, the courtly splendor and the guards, which were useful for a certain period of time. At this time, it seemed best to dissolve, transform or keep them for traditional reasons. But the disbanded guards were not useless armies, right? No, you should definitely not see it that way. There might be a possibility of seeing the guards as useless armies with their colorful uniforms, which had made a very strong impression on people. But it is important to note, for example, especially in the Second World War, that the Palatine Guard had a very important function. They had to protect the extraterritorial areas of the Vatican because many people had fled to these areas. Those politically persecuted, Jewish citizens, and all who, especially during the German occupation between 1943 and 1944, feared for their lives. But we can look even further back in history. If we look at the revolutionary year 1848, when the Pope had to flee from Rome because he was in danger in the Quirinal Palace, where he resided at the time, a crowd of people who had been stirred up threatened to storm the palace, and a small group of both the Noble Guard and the Swiss Guards managed to protect the Pope and halt the potential invasion. What became of the Papal Gendarmerie? With this guard, there was a certain degradation. The Papal Gendarmerie was downgraded to the so-called Vigilanza, that is, a guard choir. This shift could also be seen in their uniform. Previously, they had a very splendid uniform. The gala uniform was a Napoleonic cut with a high bearskin cap. It was very grand. At the beginning of the change, they wore bourgeois clothes, but then they were given a peaked cap. The guards themselves began to feel like night security guards. Thus, the guard had been completely downgraded. After many years, it was evident that this could not continue because the papal gendarmerie developed a feeling of inferiority. It was decided that they would get their old name back, not papal gendarmerie, but Vatican gendarmerie. They would also be given a uniform that was more similar to their old uniform. The Swiss Guard in that seems to have continued its task unchanged for more than 500 years. Yeah, and that is naturally auch. This can also be understood with historical context because at the beginning of this service, the Swiss Guard had already experienced a baptism of blood. In 1527, during the Sacco de Roma, the Pope escaped to Castle Sant'Angelo. The Swiss Guard made a great sacrifice to defend the Pope and enable his escape. This has not been forgotten in history by the Popes. 
They proved their worth over the centuries and continue to maintain a very close relationship between the Pope and the Swiss Guards to this present day. Thank you, Mr. Nefsinger. With pleasure. After the break, rediscover Pope John Paul II through the photographic lens of Giancarlo Giuliani, photographer to the papal household for 27 years. Just steps away from St. Peter's Square on a quiet, narrow side street called Borgo Pio, a tiny gallery has inaugurated a photographic exhibition dedicated to the pontificate of St. John Paul II. Giancarlo Giuliani photographed the legendary Pope for 27 years. The Pope was on a mission because he was an incredible character, very human. He had excellent relationships with journalists and photographers. I also believe that he was sometimes an accomplice for us photographers in our work. When he saw the great ceremonies, the beautiful ceremonies, the quantity, the young people, especially at World Youth Days. I followed, then I made 103 out of 104 trips abroad. Beautiful memories. Through his work, Giancarlo got to know John Paul II, not only at public events, but also the private ones, such as hiking in the mountains and also summers at Castle Gandolfo. He was very, very human from what I saw. For example, there are two things that struck me. In the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, he gave his ring to a poor family. Then, in a village a few kilometers from Maputo, I stumbled into the second striking moment when visiting this camp, the shack of all sheet metal. It really struck me seeing an old woman kneeling on the ground looking at him. He caressed her. Then he called Stanislas, the secretary, and I saw that he gave her some money to help her and she remained there. These are the things that struck me about this man. He was a man, a worker. He worked in the mines, you know. He knew life and therefore that was his greatness. Come non essere grati a questo Dio che ci ha redenti spingendosi fino alla follia della croce a questo Dio che si è messo dalla nostra parte e vi è rimasto fino alla fine Each of these photos has a story behind it In this photo Cardinal Ratzinger is holding up the cross to the Pope on Good Friday for veneration the photo clearly represents the relationship between these two remarkable men. John Paul II kisses the cross like Jesus on the way to Calvary, and Cardinal Ratzinger helps hold the cross like Simon of Cyrene. This picture captures two great peacemakers, forever living out St. Mother Teresa's saying, peace begins with a smile. 
Giancarlo Giuliani says the Pope was a friend to every person he met. He was a Pope anyone could relate to. I hope the photos bring back some moments that I may have immortalized to remember this great man. Besides the photographs, there are also items from John Paul II's papacy, including his handwritten weekly catechesis, which began in 1982. The exhibition at the Arte Poli Gallery, launched on the October 16th anniversary of Pope John Paul II's election to the papacy, and will remain on display until April the 2nd, 2021, the 16th anniversary of the saint's death.